Mark, you are you're a list MP, yeah? Yeah, Michael. Morning, morning. Yes, I, yes, sir, I am. How are you finding it? Oh, look, I, I am finding it. That it's, it's a fantastic job. I've been involved with politics for now four and a bit years. I spent a lot of time going up and down the country talking to all things rural and rural people. So I'm... I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's it, it can be a bit onerous, but, you know, I'm a farmer by trade and obviously advocating for rural people. Um, sees me travel the country a lot. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to advocate on behalf of those people. Yes, because um, Act did very well, not just at the last election, but the election before that, with rural folk. Why, why do you think you've got a, a, a good following amongst rural New Zealanders? Uh, Michael, I, I start from the belief of what is the problem and, and I think that in my role and in the role of what goes on with the ACT Party, that is a core tenet when we're trying to ascertain the problem. And a lot of the politics that we put into, you might say, the discussion uh, involved was, was problem definition. What is the problem? What are the solutions? And when we're looking at the, you know, the cost-benefit analysis of that, kind of reality. It puts pragmatism in the lens and I think sadly a lot of the politics prior didn't. Because mm. the National Party used to be, well still is presumably, um, the party of the farmer, it was always known as. It'd be easy, it'd be, uh, why, why would ACT suddenly be able to be hoovering up many of those ex-National Party votes? What, what was it that attracted you? Was it that the National Party's become too pragmatic? Uh, no, sir. I think uh, uh, quite often there was some, there was evangelical sermons, you might say, offered by national, which sadly didn't often speak to the the problems and, and, and some of the nuances by virtue of outcomes. And we saw it in the fresh water space, we saw it in the climate space, um, and I think farmers were inherently disgruntled that the party evolved, and this is not a criticism, it's perhaps more of a critique of national they were missing an action with advocacy for problem definition and outcome with, with rural people. I noticed it certainly. Uh, my constituency noticed it. And I would just argue on the back of 2020 re election results and certainly 2023, there's been a movement to act uh, in, in the rural setting uh, predicated largely on that, I think. Yeah, I think uh, is it uh, people perceive national to be too centrist and 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 um, and therefore inherently and it's seeking that centre position. It means that you go <laughs> after the big numbers. The big numbers are in the cities. Yeah, if it's a contest Absolutely. between metropolitan and rural, metropolitan wins. Absolutely, and I, and I would just add to that in in in, the, in this game of politics, and for want of a better word, you have to risk offending a few people, and sometimes. Mm. Um, and, and what I mean by that, ask the hard questions. There is a propensity, I maintain, some of the times uh, that our national colleagues choose not to ask those hard questions and have those hard conversations, we're willing to. Um, and I, you know, I make the point that certainly in rural New Zealand where some of those very salient issues, those hard to discuss issues that are often left unanswered, uh, we were willing to have those conversations and answer those questions. So I think that's where you see the distinction between national and act, certainly in the last couple of election cycles. Um, have you ever done a breakdown, I suppose you have at some stage, um, of where you're, where the ACT Party's most popular? Is it, is it, does it tend to be in, say, I mean, okay, let's, does, is it in the rural areas rather than the metropolitan or the provincial? Is it in the South Island compared to, say, oh, I don't know, Northland or anywhere else? Do you have a sort of a sense of that? Yes, yeah, sir, I do. Um, obviously, between Epsom and Tamaki, where we do exceedingly well, um, the, and, and, and acknowledging that. Also, I would add the rural, you know, advocacy that I have done and now with Andrew Hoggart on board, we have seen eight out of our 10 electorates do exceedingly well uh, in the rural space. And, and, you know, a lot of those are in the South Island and certainly Southland. And it goes back to some of the core conversations and again around causality, cause uh, and effect. And I think because we put a lot of pragmatism into our conversations, and that's certainly what I believe we do, from cost-benefit analysis, really 
Um, what are the problems we're seeking to fix? And if the, the costs don't outweigh, uh, sorry, if the costs um, outweigh the benefits, then perhaps we shouldn't be doing it. It's the kind of things that we take into conversation. That has resonated exceedingly well with rural folk and, and certainly eight out of our 10 electorates that we did exceedingly well in or areas um, was predicated on that. Mm, okay, which brings me to our next issue, which is Land Corp. Um, I've, listen, good God, I was an MP. As I said, uh, mm. I think within my constituency, I had a Land Corp farm, but I had nothing to do with them. And they just sort of carried on, you know, well, frankly, farming, doing their job. Explain to me how many farms in New Zealand or commercial enterprises, rural commercial enterprises, does Land Corp actually own or run? Look, I'm going to work on land area. Um, it's significant. So we're talking about tens of thousands of hectares. And I, I just make a couple of what I think are salient remarks. Any rural folk in the private citizenry that were to run at a continual loss, and this is the crux of the issue that we're really getting into here, is that these land court farms have run year in, year out, more recently, at a loss. And that is being funded by the taxpayer good. And the dear old citizenry, which is the taxpayer, that is, you know, arguably footing the bill for all of this, is, um, you know, inherently fraught with the outcome because the, 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 the costs that these properties are running to and, you know, the losses they are making is, is only growing. And I, and I would add to that, if the private citizenry was in the same fiscal position, Michael, they wouldn't be operating for much longer, I would, I would argue. Uh, they would almost fall into receivership and certainly not have to really look at the, the sustainability of that economic modelling. And it's, it, it, it's the old story. When, when, when people have the skin and, and, and a bit of blood and sweat and tears in, in the game, you can guarantee the outcomes will be better. And I just make the point, I certainly don't see that with these land court farms, which are routinely running at a loss. Mm. It's, um, I'm looking here, I've gone to the website of, um, of uh, PAMU, as it calls itself now. Yes. And um, you can itemise in each of the various regions of New Zealand uh, which farming units um, it, 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 you, there are, oh God, I'm probably looking at this and thinking maybe there are 30 or 40 um, different farms. Again, I want to come back to this basis. Why? Why is the government involved in farming at all? Well, the, the, the early onset of you know, Palmu, prior to being called Palmu, was, of course, Lancourt, which you've, you've just identified. That, that was a arguably in, in its infancy a very good system it helped young people get into farming it was a relationship between the crown and the private citizenry it often created an environment where young farmers could work into what we call lease to buy arrangements and then by virtue into farm ownership and a lot of the advocacy and innovation that was found on, on land court farms and bled, bled into the private citizenry and the practices on farms. So it was a good was a good system when it worked. Subsequently, over the years, th that has morphed into what, uh, this gargantuan system, which spends an exorbitant sum of money to remain sustainable. And we see with the many business types that it has, and we we know that that Palmu operates with, with, with deer to dairy, sheep and beef um, to forestry, when one part of the operation runs at a loss, it cross-subsidises with another model. Now, no farmer in, the, in, the, in the, the citizenry of New Zealand could afford to do that. And um, I just make the last remark, and that is predicated on this continual flow of money from the tax take. So I understand why it was created, but the argument now is, is, should it continue to exist? I would suggest not, because it's certainly not running um, in, in the fiscal constraints that would be afforded to everyday Kiwis.